everybody, and welcome back to the GKC show. We're here for episode 11, I believe we are saying wow. at this point. <laughs> no, Roll, rolling up. Uh, and we have a special guest with us here today, Renee Leibler. And uh, so, Sam, if you want to do a little brief introduction, I know you know Renee a little bit better than I do. Absolutely. So, Renee and I actually met at uh, NFT NYC, the conference up in New York. Um, We've been working together on a few things, and we've really been wanting to do a podcast that was specifically about women in Web3. Um, and we'll get a little more into, you know, what we want to talk about. But just to introduce Renee a little bit, I'm actually going to bring up her LinkedIn profile because there's no way I could remember all of this. <laughs> so currently, she has about 73 jobs. Uh, one of them is founder and partner at Harmonic Chain. That's her investment uh, arm. Um, she's honorary co-chairperson of the U.S. Commerce Department Certified Trade Mission for Blockchain and Digital Asset Fund Managers. That is the U.S. Commerce Department. Uh, founder and president of NYU Blockchain Digital Asset Forum, adjunct professor professor at Stevens Institute of Technology, adjunct professor professor at Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, I'm not sure how she has time to sleep, let alone join us. I'm really, really excited to have her here as uh, probably among our most uh, uh, smartest and most accomplished guests we've had so far. Yeah, so yeah. Um, don't be too excited because we, that, I mean, we have your genie on here so right um, <laughs> um but but yeah like i said today we really wanted to specifically talk about women in web3 and with renee as not only a female pioneer in web3 but a pioneer in general in web3 regardless of sex i thought you were the perfect person that i know to talk about um and some of the things a friend of ours uh renee and mine named pamela norton actually testifying uh, before the House Financial Services Committee on some of these issues, and I brought up some of her testimony, uh, spoiler alert, if anybody watches yeah, <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, so some of the statistics, uh, decentralized and, and fintech startups raised about $2.1 billion in the first quarter of 2022, and NFT-focused startups raised about $2.4 billion in that same quarter. Um, all, all across the board, crypto startups were over $5 billion just in Q1. And of that $5 billion, approximately from what Pamela was able to find, and she's very knowledgeable in this, uh, about $7.1 million was raised for female uh, founded and female led uh, companies in the crypto space. Um, some of that can be chalked up to kind of the bro culture of uh, the, the VC world. Um, some of it can be chalked up to just the anecdotal thing that we all see that, you know, crypto is male dominated. There's my cat, Leland. <laughs> um, he always makes an appearance. Um, and uh, personally, I believe that the best way that Web3 as a whole can move forward and specifically with the NFT.com community is be to be as inclusive as possible and be as diverse as possible and so there's obviously inequities going on here and that are happening in the space and i think the best thing that we can do for our community and for web3 in general is to exploit them and find ways to get women involved to get a more diverse culture and renee as a leader in the industry we would love to hear your thoughts and how how you think we can do that and how as a community we can help help bring more women into into the space sure um, well thank you so much for inviting me first off and, and thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction uh, I do have plenty of time to sleep by the way I love to sleep <laughs> uh, but I also love I also love to work also um, so uh, lots to talk about here uh, a real lot to talk about and so However, one of the things that I would like to start is I'd like to start off as to how I got into the space and, um, and maybe that helps um, other people as well, particularly women that are interested in getting into, um, in getting into the space. So 2014, uh, it was my CTO. Uh, I was working on a startup that was in the mobile space and he said, you need to look into this thing called Bitcoin. And I basically poo-pooed him for at least a good six months and said, yeah, 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 we have a company to run, don't have time for that right now. And finally, when I did, um, I was wowed and, you know, read the initial Bitcoin white paper, et cetera. And 
I thought to myself, wow, this technology can potentially solve a lot of problems that, um, that we've seen. So, um, and that's when I decided to take a deep dive into this space, knowing nothing about the space. And then just like many people, you fall down the rabbit hole and you start to research and research and research. And um, I'm trying to remember uh, exactly when I got introduced to um, a lot of the developers in the community. And, uh, and the reason why I really want to highlight that, it was probably around 2016, uh, as I was doing my research, you know, you're on Twitter, you're on Medium, and you're learning, learning, learning. And, uh, and I think it was actually on Twitter where I got connected to uh, some of the uh, developers. And um, not being a developer myself, although in my um, professional career, I had always been the one, I did go to a technical school, although I didn't become an engineer, I was always the one that connected the technical with, say, sales and marketing or, or finance. I was kind of the middle person that I could speak both languages. So, um, so what I wanted to say, and I actually, whenever I speak with young women and try to get them involved in STEM, and particularly this space, I always emphasize the fact that I know that we talk about the bros, but it was the bros that were the ones that taught me in the beginning. And, I, and the reason I bring that up is because when I entered this space, which uh, in historically, you know, all of the technical spaces, all of the STEM spaces have been male dominated. Uh, and we can go into reasons why. Uh, but um, they were the ones that taught me initially. And this space, I think, is so amazing. And I, I think it's probably because it was born out of open source. And this is, you know, this is my experience, is that if you show an interest in wanting to learn, if you show an interest of wanting to enter this space, there are people out there that will help you and teach you. And that was my experience, uh, which kind of wowed me in that, like, wow, I, I'm just trying to learn. And I remember in the early days, um, sitting down uh, you know, in bars down on, uh, in, in Manhattan, uh, on the Lower East Side with a couple of developers that I met and started to become friendly with. And they would sit with me for hours teaching me, I don't understand how this works. I don't understand. What's grin? How does that work? Um, and, and just, you know, writing and, and making diagrams for me and really teaching me. And, uh, and, and so to this day, I really spend a lot of my time supporting the developers. And uh, I do think that in many instances that the developers in either web two or in the financial industry have somewhat been taken advantage of a lot of their knowledge has been extracted and they're not necessarily the ones that have reaped uh, the financial rewards so I, i'm very passionate about um, supporting that community as well I, i'm a co-organizer of the bitcoin core developers here in new york city and um and I, I really try to uh, keep in touch with that community. So if you're a woman, um, young women in my classes that I teach, I have lots of young women. I always say to them, this community is very welcoming. If you want to learn, you will be able to find people that will take the time to teach you. Yeah, the people the people that are doing the real work behind the scenes are very open-minded and accepting people uh it's that bro culture that's just on the surface that's and to be honest those people aren't really that involved they're tra right. they're day trading stuff to make a quick buck here and there um, yeah, but the real nuts and bolts and stuff those those are really good communities um so that's my recommendation. Oh. Dive into something. Find a mentor who can teach you as opposed to just trying to fit in with the social 
aspect. Yeah, and it's usually those people that are most vocal on Twitter, for example. Uh, and, and I think that's where maybe some of the bad connotations come from regarding the bro culture. As you said, are not the people that are down uh, you know, in the trenches doing stuff, right. building stuff, and trying to figure out how do we get more mainstream adoption in Web3, NFTs, blockchain, et cetera. And, um, and the way to do that is, you know, certainly if you're in New York City, but most big cities now have meetups. And, and fortunately, we've gone back. I know in New York, we've gone back to a lot of in-person things, which we missed during the pandemic. Um, but uh, there are tons of meetups that you can go to and then just show up. Even at our Bitcoin core developer meetup, which we have one tomorrow, anyone's invited. And we don't care. You can be super technical, super knowledgeable, or you can know nothing and just want to come and say, hey, I really kind of, what is this Bitcoin thing? I'd like to find out something about it. Yeah, um, one thing that you said, Renee, was uh, talking about how uh, since Web3 was born open source, I think the other side of that is born with decentralization is another big piece of it. And kind of everybody's in control. Um, you know, when you look at Web 2 and you look at the birth of the Internet, it was, you know, it was companies and clicks. It was it was Microsoft and it was Oracle and it was Apple and they were all doing their own thing. Whereas Web 3 was born through collaboration and everybody's working on it and you're you're mining and you're making money, but you're a part of the ecosystem. And it's it's a it's a pervasive thing that you still feel this day, and I hope continues that whenever you get in a group of web free enthusiasts, people are looking to collaborate. They're looking to work with each other. They're not saying, oh, well, let me I hold my cards really close to the vest because everybody wants to work on a bunch of different projects. And the only way to do that is to collaborate. And, and that's I was going to say, that's really the only way that we're going to be able to push this space forward, because. I mean, right now we're still at the early adopter phase, um, even though, you know, I teach classes and even though I, I teach people 18 to 21, mostly undergraduates, I teach a few graduate classes also, but, um, but uh, many of them still don't even know what, like, what's a wallet? How do I set up a wallet? And it's still not, it's, we're, of course, we're getting a whole lot better, but it's still not super easy, super seamless and and those are the things that uh that we're building right now to make it available to everyone and actually one of the things that i uh, talk about in my class when i give a whole history of the internet is that web one the initial founders of the internet their vision was decentralization and it was later where Web2 developed, where we had these entities like the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples mm -hmm. of the world. Uh, you know, we have, you know, a handful, four or five companies that control most of the data that flows through Web2. And that's not, that wasn't the initial vision uh, of, the, of the founders of the internet. So we're really, for Web3, we're really going back to what the initial vision was, and uh, which I think is so cool and so exciting um, in that we, you know, so many people have felt left out. And, and you can go into all kinds of stats regarding banked, unbanked, uh, percentages of, uh, I, I saw a stat yesterday of, what was it, over about 90% of equities that are owned by, you know, the 1% and then everyone else uh, doesn't participate. So when you talk about, you know, fractionalization of ownership or, you know, I, t I tell my students, you know, you guys probably don't remember the days when you would uh, go have want to, you know, go buy stock where you needed a stockbroker. You didn't have the Robin Hoods where you could buy you know, $20 worth of Apple. Um, so all of these things that have been developing, and this is very much a part of Web3, have to do with inclusion, decentralization, inclusion, 
And, and, and that was what made me so excited when I first started to take a deeper dive into this space. Being a woman uh, and being a, an entrepreneur for most of my professional career, uh, you, I know that Sam, you talked about some of the stats that, um, that Pamela is, is trying to bring to the attention of, of people in Congress right now is that I did experience that. I did experience how tough it was when I was out there uh, in my early days of trying to raise money uh, as a woman, as a woman founder. And uh, I, I tell my students, particularly my female students, it's a lot better today than it was just in when I was doing it in 2014. And um, so we've made some strides and we have a long way to go, of course, and it's not just women, it's, just, it's any underrepresented um, group of people, really. And, uh, but, I mean, that being said, I think that Web3 is going to be the push that brings us, I think, to the next level uh, right. of inclusion. Great. Could I pick your brain a little bit? Because you were talking uh, about, uh, you know, when the first iterations of the web were coming out. Um, it's my understanding that payment rails were supposed to be, were, you know, when it was talking about decentralization, that payment rails were also supposed to be something that were baked into the internet, but they couldn't figure out really a way to do it. Do you have any insight into almost as if the web was meant to have cryptocurrency as, uh, you know, some form of decentralized payment method, but, only until now we have the ability to, to do that. Yeah, um, you know, as far as the early, the, the, the founders of the internet, uh, which goes back to several researchers uh, at MIT and um, I'm trying to remember the, the other universities, but there were really a, a group of three, four individuals that worked on the initial founding of the internet. Uh, and then of course, it uh, got skipped up by the DOD. And, and then from there, it became commercialized. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as my understanding is, is that yes, that was a vision to have payment rails, but we didn't have the technology right. yet to do that. Uh, but it certainly was always part of the vision. So the when you read about the initial vision being a way to share information uh, in a decentralized, I mean, the word decentralized is used. If you look at the initial research papers mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a decentralized manner, open to everyone, it was only, you know, I mean, later, they, they never envisioned of, of data being owned by an entity, you know, such as a Google or an Amazon, or an Apple. Um, so, I mean, so we're Just getting back to that. And so, and, yeah. They had envisioned so, something more free-flowing where everybody just had access to it, but it wasn't, you know, who owns it? <laughs> 100%, right. 100%. It wasn't, the initial vision was that it wasn't owned by anyone, necessarily. That it was, that it was community-based. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're just simply getting back to that. So regarding payment rails, I mean, we really never had, uh, you know, regarding uh, a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized uh, payment system was the first that we read about that was, I mean, we had a couple different papers and, and people were looking into it uh, pre-Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin white paper was really one of the first to really detail a method that uh, could actually work, and um, and you know, and then of course from there we've had all kinds of iterations. Um, I, I, I often oh, I was just going to say, I often say that many times you say, well, Bitcoin came first, and then blockchain. So then when we had blockchain or decentralized technology, then all kinds of things kind of you know blossomed off of mm -hmm. that. Well, it seems right now that the the payment solution is an add-on, uh, uh, you know, is a browser plugin or something like that. Do you see a future in which the which gen distributed ledgers are baked into the way the internet w works, or will it always be kind of this 
additional layer that gets draped on top of it? Yeah, um, good question. Sorry if I'm turning you into a futurist. Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's a really good question that I think all of us are trying to figure out. I think everyone has an opinion. Um, my opinion is that we're not going to replace our legacy financial system, but that it will be a hybrid. Uh, I, I think that we'll have that decentralization. We already see DeFi, for example, being adopted and, and, uh, and looked at by our legacy financial institutions like the Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanley's, the Black Rocks, so, you know, of the world. They're very well aware that decentralization, DeFi, is something that is going to eventually be baked into our financial structure. So, so my opinion is that we're going to have a hybrid. It's, it's going to take some time, but that we're eventually going to um, get to some type of um, integration. Uh, but then I also think that you probably will have alternate rails. And when you look at, um, you know, the countries that have gone through extreme inflation and have had their currencies devalued, like um, Argentina, uh, Greece, Turkey, you can give, you know, various examples of people that have lost all of their savings, all of their wealth because of the devaluation of the local currency. Or um, the other example is what happens if um, the person that comes into power in a particular country uh, is a person of, uh, is, is not a good person, right? And, and starts to take control of whatever you might own or whatever is in the bank that all of a sudden you can't, if you decide that you wanna leave one country for another, you can't take it with you. I mean, we certainly saw that, you know, World War II. It's not impossible for that to ever happen again. But as far as being self-sovereign and being able to have control over you know, what you own, so your savings, wouldn't it be cool to have some type of alternate rail that is not controlled by any central entity? And, and I think those are the things that are right now being explored. Uh, you know, and particularly with countries that are experiencing extreme inflation. Sure, we've seen inflation here in the U.S., but it's nothing like what they're seeing in Argentina, for example. Yeah, I mean, digital currency is coming. <clears throat> Sovereign nations are going to form digital currencies. But, uh, you know, to your point, it's, again, kind of the hybrid across the board where there's still another alternative something that isn't, you know, a US or a Chinese or a French or a UK digital currency. There is something else. So you have an alternative and that's just free market 101. I mean, competition breeds creativity and it breeds, it breeds innovation and it breeds, uh, you know, the best allocation of resources. So that's the best for everyone. And kind of what you were talking about, it really, it, we talk about this a lot where we, you know, the, the blanket term is web three. But in reality, it's going to be a web 2.5 or a web 2.75. And that's okay. Right. It should be. It should be some kind of uh, a hybrid. And it's, you know, if you talk about the metaverse, like you don't want to live, you shouldn't want to live your entire life in the metaverse. So you live a portion of it in the metaverse, doing right. metaverse things, and then you live out in the real world. Um, but to kind of bring it back, I think those, some of those web 2 um, entities, some of those VC firms, some of those large financial institutions are are pulling against the decentralization, even though they understand that it's, they have to hedge, they want to kind of push it off as much as possible because everybody understands whether it's Goldman Sachs or whether it's Facebook or whether it's whomever, the more control people get of their data and their digital lives, the less money they're going to be able to make off of it, the less they can monetize it. And the more, all of a sudden, the market becomes more efficient because these companies are going to have to to compete for our business. We don't compete with each other for their services. They have to compete in order to provide services to us. And I think that's where it becomes where the beauty of, of Web3 is it can be so inclusive because the best ideas win, the best products win. And it's irrespective of your race or your gender or your socioeconomic background or your education, 
good ideas win, hard work along with good ideas wins, and you know, opportunities in the metaverse. Like when some of these pitches that like, go to VCs, um, you know, they you know, see a guy who they were who was in their fraternity. It's like, okay, well, he's getting his money. Uh, well, what if it was your avatar that was pitching the idea, and it wasn't necessarily your avatar doesn't have a sex or a race, or uh, you know, the pitch becomes just about the idea, right. and that's where you can find truly the most efficient, um, you know, most efficient market uh, evolution that you can imagine. Yeah, uh, you know what, Sam? I never actually thought about it that way, but a couple of things that you said really resonated me. Um, I was actually. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was with some of my family members who worked for Apple for a very long time, and they were talking to me about their hiring process. We were talking about inclusion. We were particularly talking about women uh, getting into tech, and and she was explaining to me that there's no that for. I don't think they ever know. They you never have a picture of the person. You never know what their gender is. You just have their you know their details of their bio. So getting back to what you said regarding doing pitches in the metaverse where, you know, I could be wh whomever I want to be. I don't necessarily have to be the way I look, um, which is so amazing to think about. And yes, we have lots of stats regarding, and as I said, I experienced this myself, is that people, and particularly in venture capital, they... Um, VCs have wanted to invest in people that were like them, right? Which is uh, male, young, Ivy League education, you know, white male, et cetera. And, and sure, I did experience that um, when I was out there raising money in, in, as I said, not that long ago, 2014. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there was one time I was raising money and I brought in someone who uh, was on my advisory board with me when I was uh, pitching, it was actually, I think it was an insurance company. And they were asking me questions that later my advisor, who happened to be a male said, I can't believe they asked you that. He was like, good call on your answers, but I don't think they would have ever have asked me those questions. Right. And um, so, you know, those are the things that we've had to experience. But that being said, I think that we're making a lot of progress and particularly if we could do that in the metaverse. I mean, that's the way it should be. So I mentioned Apple and the way they currently hire is that, I mean, we're already going there, right? Where you don't have a picture of someone, you don't necessarily see, you know, oh, do they look like me? Then they must be okay. Uh, that's the way it should be. And that's the way we're going. And I think like even like the metaverse is going to give us a whole nother dimension for that. I mean, those are going to be the cool ways, right? That we'll be able to use and the metaverse. The metaverse will allow you to get the best of both worlds because while it's great to have a CV and it's great to have information, like you do want to talk to somebody. You want to know if this is a person that you're going to, if it's a sales position, someone that you're going to feel comfortable putting in front of uh, clients, not because of how, how they look, but how they comport themselves. So the metaverse could be an opportunity to have the best of both worlds. You could understand their inflection and how they speak and, and how eloquent they are, but also not be bound by this is a guy who looks like me or this is a woman who does not look like me. Right. Yeah, there, there right. are great area, uh, opportunities for inclusion within the Web3 space, I think. It, it, we were talking the other week about uh, distributed identity uh, and how you can kind of pick and choose what people get to see about you without actually getting to see the information. I think that kind of stuff is very important to inclusion. So it's, I can show my credentials that, yes, I'm old enough to be able to take this position. I have the certifications that are necessary for it. But you don't need to know that, you know, I'm a 19 year old female who's just, you know, or, or that I'm a 78 year old guy or, a, <laughs> you know, I think that. So um, that, that's actually um, a really important point to bring out um, about where we're going in Web3 and we could even bring in, you know, NFTs as well. So currently unbelievably we still have to enter a whole bunch of information like let's say you're applying for a job right 
you have to enter in all of this information, your address, social security number, your birth date, et cetera, et cetera. What if, and this is, we're going to see this, I, I think very shortly, what if we had, whether it be an NFT or, or something that has all of that data in it, but as you said, we can make that visible or, or whatever information that we want to release to someone, but we already have that identity that, that we can use anywhere and decide whether I'm going to release my birth date or whether I'm going to release my social security number. Uh, instead of having to put this data in again and again and again, and all of this data right now sits on centralized servers, which are, as we know, are very vulnerable to hacks. They're getting hacked all the time. Every day we see another one, um, which from a security standpoint, we, uh, we, need to, we need to do so much better and we can do so much better. And we're, as far as what I'm seeing is being built is that we're really, really close to that. Yeah. Where we're going to have a much better system, which is much more secure. And, and even uh, so, so from a human resource standpoint, uh, I, you know, I'd like to think that human resource people are all very good people. But given the opportunity to, if I see someone's address on an application, maybe I'm curious to put that into Zillow, and now I can see. Okay, now I have their address. I know where they live. I can find out a little bit more about their socio socioeconomic status. That might be something that's like, hey, maybe I don't want somebody at my business that's from that side of the tracks. So I, I love the idea of being able to present. I am a lawful resident of of this city. Whatever and city, that's, right? That's all you need to know. You don't need to know my address. You don't need to know any other things that might allow you to infringe upon my, I don't know, design. Exactly. Oh, yeah. well, you know what, you're, you're so right. And actually there are two things that come to mind when you said that. Um, one is when I was pitching Venture Capital, I did have one Venture Capital partner do exactly that, mm -hmm. looked up my address and found, you know, you can see my house on Google Maps, right? And, and knew exactly <laughs> where I lived. I thought, hmm, that was a little strange. <laughs> But, uh, but it's human, but right? It's curious. People are going to do it. You're never going to stop unless you don't provide them with the information, right? And people will uh, default to doing uh, the wrong thing eventually, given enough people to make that decision. <laughs> yes, but I don't know if you saw this week, there was something that came out regarding, uh, it was a professor, a professor of color who was having his house, I think he wanted to get a mortgage and, uh, and the house was being valued and he put in his correct information and the house had one value. And then he put in the information from his buddy who was not a person of color and the house was valued twice as much. I mean, that hit all of the newspapers. Yeah. So those yeah. things happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it needs to be brought to our attention. And that's what we're trying to get away from, right? A fair, yeah, a fairer world to live in, I think. Data, exactly. and, data and identity ownership may end up being the two most important aspects of Web3. Owning your own data, protecting your own identity, they, they may be the things that really make the biggest change. Uh, because we, like you were saying, right, your, your data is everywhere. Your data is everywhere. Everybody has it. Even the people you don't give it to get it from the people you do. And but if you if you if your application for an insurance policy or a car loan or whatever it is, if that's just you input your token at that point, they get to read it and then you pull your token out. That's it. They can still do metrics on we've had this, these types of people that applied and this and that, but they don't know anything about you because you don't allow them to. That's where Web3 can, can make massive changes, um, especially, you know, as we get more interconnected and as there's more access and as more people can look you up on Google Maps or find you through, you know, your hobbies on Facebook. Um, that kind of protection is going to be invaluable. So I, I, I so, so agree. I mean, that's why I'm sure. so passionate about the space. So, you know, as I said, that 
back in the early days when I started to read about it and all of the problems, all of the inequities that I saw, even the inequities that I experienced as a woman uh, when I was out there raising capital, I was like, you know what? This is the technology. So when we, this is the technology that's going to help us when we, we, we had the social movement, but, um, but didn't really have the technology necessarily to help us get there. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is when you talk about, uh, we talk about the bro culture within the VCs and things like that, they're, they're at many times running up against the brick wall when they enter the web free space because the web three core community is so savvy to that and we see it coming a mile away. And when it happens, it's just, it's, you know, there's the economic term, dirt term dirtying the brand and it almost dirties the brand of, of projects that get involved that way. And, you know, I'd like any, like any legacy institution, they're going to hold on for as long as they can, but you can't stop what's happening in web three and decentralization. Um, the only thing, but I think, I do think it's incumbent on us as much as possible to help speed up, I don't want to say their demise, but yeah, their demise. Um, at least the, way, the, the demise of the way business. Usher um, in a new chapter is a nicer way to say. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we see it in, you know, this is uh, where this is for the Genesis Key community, uh, the Genesis GKC, the Genesis Key Club for NFT.com. NFT and I mean, listen, the GKC Lounge is a bunch of bros for the most part. And it's not by design, it's just how it is. And so any opportunity we have to reach out to to women or um, minority people who don't look like us or sound like us or necessarily live in our neighborhood and, and educate about, this is about web free, this is about NFT.com. This is what we're all about and here's an opportunity to get involved. It's, good, it's only going to make everything better for everyone. The more people, the more ideas, the more points of view we have involved. And the one thing I did want to hit before we wrapped up was, so Pamela, the Pamela Norton was who we were talking about. She's testified for, Con for Congress. You want to check out an awesome project. Her project title chain is essentially looking to tokenize about $31 trillion in assets. So that could be a big deal down the road. Uh, check it out. Um, but she's a great, um, Ayn Rand quote uh, in her testimony, when you see that money is flowing to those who deal not in goods but in favor, when you see that men get richer by graft and by pull than by work, and your laws don't protect you against them, but protect them against you, when you see the corruption being rewarded and honesty, honestly becoming a self-sacrifice, you may know that your society is doomed. And um, <laughs> fantastic quote, and it could very well be true, uh, if not for, uh, Web3 and Big change, uh, yeah. female leaders like Renee, and hopefully all of us who, who want to bring about change. So that's all I got, other than <laughs> Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for inviting me. This yes. is great. Uh, thank you for having a topic about uh, Web3 and how we can be more inclusive, getting more people, women, other uh, under underrepresented individuals into the space. And I just want to repeat. Just please come in, find people that you can connect with. We'll teach you because yeah, that's what we want. We yeah. want more people in this space. Amen to that. Yeah, go find go find a good Discord channel. Go find a good Medium channel. Get into get into the places where people are, you know, teaching each other, and stay away from the places where people are just trying to hawk something for a quick buck. Exactly. Definitely. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Renee, for coming on. This was a fantastic episode. Uh, I think this definitely uh, is something for all of our viewers to chew on. Uh, and while they're chewing, they should smash the like button, subscribe, and uh, we'll catch you all in the GKC Lounge in the meantime. But uh, until then, we will see you all next week. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.